Look, we're joined today by a lot of good friends and friends of labor and friends of the community. I'm going to ask our, our, next, um, our next partner to come up. Rabbi Jeffrey Myers is, is a rabbi and a, a cantor for the Tree of Life here in Pittsburgh. And, and if you'll remember the 2018 attack on the synagogue we, in which 11 people lost their lives, Jeffrey's become an outspoken advocate for the use of using love and understanding to counter the feel and fear and violence and the hatred that came with that. So we're proud today to welcome him as he's generously come to give the invocation for today's ceremony. Rabbi Myers. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, and to those of you who are visiting Pittsburgh, welcome to Pittsburgh. We specially ordered a sunny day for you. For those Yinzers, you know how rare that is. <laughs> Permit me to start with Psalm number one. There are 150 Psalms. This is the first one. Blessed is the one who never follows the counsel of the wicked, who never lingers with sinners nor associates with scoffers. The one who is blessed delights in the Torah of God and meditates upon it day and night. Like a tree planted by running water, whose foliage never withers and who, which produces its fruit in season, a blessed individual prospers in every endeavor. It is not so with the wicked. They are like wind-driven chaff. The wicked shall not be upheld when their life is judged nor will the sinners remain in the company of the righteous. The way of the just finds favor with God. The way of the wicked leads to destruction. Our God and God of our ancestors, bless the leaders of the United Steelworkers Union with wisdom, vigor, and understanding. Sustain them with your spirit. Grant that their labors be a blessing and a source of blessing. And let us say, Amen. I was going to add far more. But world events demanded that I change my prayer, as there are people right now in Ukraine who need our prayers more than we do. I'm compelled to offer a prayer for peace. The interesting thing about looking up the definition of the word peace is that so many sources utilize the word normal in the definition. I would submit to you that we do not know anymore what normal is supposed to be or look like. It is not that we are just jaded, but sometimes we have this resignation about us as acts of violence just seem to flow with great regularity like a mighty stream with no lessening in sight. The Hebrew word for peace, many of you already know. It is the word shalom, in Arabic, salam. It can also mean hello or goodbye depending upon the context of the moment. The remarkable thing about the word shalom is that the root of the word in Hebrew has nothing to do at all with the word peace. Its root means wholeness or completeness. Before we pray, let us ponder this for a moment. Within Hebrew scriptures, someone who had shalom thus was whole and complete. If you were not in a state of shalom, you were incomplete. To me, it captures the state of affairs in our lives. They are incomplete, not yet whole, because we lack the constancy of shalom. The creators of the Jewish prayer book, which was finalized nearly 2,000 years ago, thought long and hard about what prayer they might want to end the thrice daily services with. And in the end, they decided to end with a prayer for shalom. For all of our prayers ultimately lead us to a sense of wholeness and completeness. Thus, the prayer for shalom became the concluding prayer of our services. I'd like to offer to you the prayer in English. I pray that it is not merely an oddity that you've never heard it before, but a vehicle that carries aloft to God all of our collective desires 
that shalom not be a hope, but a reality. Grant universal peace with happiness and blessing, grace, love, and mercy for us and for all the inhabitants of this world. Bless us, our creator, one and all, with your light. For you have given us, by that light, the guide to a life of caring, filled with generosity and contentment, kindness and well-being, and shalom. May it please you to bless all people in every season and at all times with your gift of shalom. Praised are you, God, who blesses all of the inhabitants of the world with shalom. And let us all say, Amen. All right, phone's off. Um, look, our, our next speaker is a tremendous friend of this union um, and is, is weathered through last year in, in a, showing a strength and grace that um, few other people have been forced to dis display. So Liz Schuler is a longtime friend of our union. And she's been a fierce advocate for workers across the world. And Liz was elected as president of AFL-CIO in August after we lost a good friend, Richie Chomka's passing. And she'd become the first woman to hold that position. Both during her time leading the AFL-CIO as a member of the IBW, and much of Liz's work has been advancing social economic justice focused on making the benefits of labor unions available to all working people. I'm particularly honored that Liz has taken the time to join us this morning and to be part of this. So please join me in welcoming President Liz Schuler, President of AFL-CIO. Good morning, good morning. It's so great to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, Tom, I appreciate you so much. Uh, you have not only been a force within the steelworkers, but a smart and savvy and strong leader within the AFL-CIO and our labor movement. And I appreciate your leadership so much. Uh, of course, John Shin, uh, Dave McCall, Roxanne Brown, Leanne Foster, uh, thank you for your incredible dedication and your leadership and passion for our movement. And Fred Redman, my partner at the AFL-CIO, who I'm so grateful for. And he's bringing a steelworker's voice inside the Federation now as Secretary Treasurer, so we are so proud. And to all the officers and the entire Steelworkers Executive Board, thank you for your service and dedication to working people across the country, Canada, and the world. And I know I saw Ken Newman in here uh, earlier, and as he's retiring, and Marty Warren's taking up his leadership. Um, I know B. Brusk is here from Canada as well, well represented here. Thank you for all, all, all of you for being here and for your leadership. It is such an honor to look across this room. And it's swearing in day where you pledge before family, before friends, family, friends, um, you know, our community to take up this oath, this sacred oath to the union, to the members that we serve, to be a good steward of our resources, to uphold the core values of the labor movement and to lead, lead with direction and purpose so that the labor movement of the future is bigger and stronger and better than it is today. And as I stand before you, there is no doubt in my mind 
about the direction that we are heading as a labor movement. We are moving forward and we are building a future that is defined by and for working people. And as I was driving up the turnpike yesterday, um, I made the mistake of riding in a car with J.P. Smith um, on the drive up from D.C. Uh, but we were talking in our car, and Isaac was with us, um, about the democratic process in your union and the strong tradition that you have of every voice being heard. And it's at the heart of the steelworkers, and it's what we stand for in the labor movement. And we thrive on democracy. Our contracts, our elections, our culture, all depends on the strong voice of our members and everyone paying attention and participating. And that is so, so important. We cannot take that for granted. As we're watching what is happening in Ukraine, thousands of miles away, we are seeing the attacks on democracy there. And we are seeing the attacks on democracy even here in the United States. The basic right to vote, our right to organize, our electoral system being undermined in the media, in online forums, in homes across America, even in our work sites and in our local unions. So we're living in an America that I would argue has never been so divided. Do you feel it? It's almost like we're living in two Americas. One America is being fed one set of information and the other America is being fed something else. And within our own country, people are, you know, they'll witness the same event but see entirely different things. And we get into these feedback loops, right? On Facebook, on Instagram, we're fed content and then there's an algorithm that watches what we're watching and keeps pulling us in and then we engage with it and then there's more of the same and it creates this echo chamber. And we step outside the bubble, we talk to family and friends and the conversations that we have can become very, very challenging, can't they? Because what we think we believe as true and what someone else believes as true is so far apart. Misinformation and disinformation, I would argue, is one of, if not the greatest threat that is facing our democracy today. It destabilizes our foundation, divides us from one another. But here's the thing. The labor movement has a unique role to play here. We are the only force in this country with enough power and enough reach to close that information divide, to heal our democracy. And we can be that trusted source of information where people come to get reliable information. And we can have the face-to-face -face conversations in the workplace about the threats that we face. And we can use our workplace conversations to lay the groundwork and educate our members on the issues, because we know that's what's gonna open up their ears. And that's what's gonna bring people back together. Because working people agree on a lot. We agree on a lot, even in a divided country. And I don't know about you, what I'm seeing out there is absolutely incredible. And it is clear that working people are hungry for change. And they're refusing to settle for less. And from the faculty and staff on the Pitt campus to healthcare workers and assisted living centers in Allegheny County, from the shipbuilders in Newport News to the healthcare workers in Southern California, the ATI workers in communities across the Northeast, from refineries to steel mills to tire plants to the Iron, uh, the iron Range, and I'm sure everything in between, because there's too many to mention, but your members are in every sector of this economy. And you've been working and persevering through this pandemic. You never stopped working. 
And now workers are using their leverage to demand more, to demand fair wages and dignity at work. So it's up to us, you all who are taking this oath today, to grow the labor movement, build on that momentum. What are we going to do with this moment in front of us? Can we reimagine an economy that works for working people? That's right. And it's our job to be there and provide the resources and the services and the support so workers can form a union and win those life-changing union contracts. So I am, again, so proud to be here with you. We are so appreciative and grateful for the USW in the Federation at all levels, not just at the national level, but at the state and the local level in our communities. Thank you for your strength, your solidarity, your activism, your engagement, for your fighting spirit. And congratulations to all of you for the honor that you have to serve your union and our movement. Together, we are an unstoppable force for working people. And the path, the path we are paving together is wide and accessible, everyone included, no one left behind. And our power to get there depends on moving as one. It depends on our collective unity with the people in this room, in our unions, and throughout the labor movement. Thank you so much. I want to thank Liz for, again, for taking the time and coming here. Look, our next speaker, um, B, comes to us from um, our membership in Canada, which is you know, one of the few unions that we really do celebrate the fact that we're a union that's made up of both of our countries. So I'm going to ask our new um, Canadian National Director, Marty Warren, to come up and introduce B. Thanks, thanks, Tom. It's my pleasure to introduce you to B. Brusque, the president of our Canadian Labour Congress. B. was elected at the 29th Constitutional Convention last June as part of a new leadership team that was supported by our union. B. is only the second woman to ever hold the office. B. has served workers and their families as an activist, Workers' advocate, negotiator, community organizer, and labor leader. Previously, B served as vice president of the USCW Canada National Council, which sets the strategic direction for the national union, and it's more than 250,000 members in Canada. She had previously served as the secretary treasurer of UFCW Local 832 where she was responsible for the largest private sector union in Manitoba, local. During this time, she also was a key activist, local leader and volunteer in the New Democratic Party, our party, Labour's party in Canada, serving on the Manitoba executive, NDP executive, and running for elected office. B's passion for rights and working people was ignited in 1987, when she and her UFCW local 832 co-workers held the line, held the line for 125 days to achieve, to achieve a fair contract at West Fair Grocery Chain in Manitoba. B took, uh, took on the roles as Shop Steward Health and Safety Committee and was elected by fellow members as the Vice President of Local Executive Board. Without any further ado, I introduce you to B. Over to you.
Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Marty. It's absolutely great to be here with you in Pittsburgh and seeing a room full of labor activists, isn't it? Come on, how, how long has it been? I'm absolutely honored to be here at the swearing-in of the United Steelworkers Canadian leadership team, along with the International Executive Board, and what an incredible team the Canadian team is. I'm honored to witness Marty Warren and, of course, Miles Sullivan behind me, Scott Lenny and Do Dominic Lemieux take their oath of office, uh, and felicitation, congratulations. I must say I'm proud to stand here with so many committed activists, and little, little would I know, uh, did I know, way back when, when I was a steelworker member working for UFCW, that I would one day have the honor of standing here, so thank you for that. It's absolutely great to be part of an international union like the Steelworkers. I have seen firsthand the value and the solidarity that happens when we can work across the borders. Both of us working very hard to make our union strong. Whether it's working together on issues of international trade or finding common cause on social justice issue, immigration or politics. Together we can stop the race to the bottom that has decimated manufacturing jobs in communities across North America. The United Steelworkers has been a leader showing cross-border solidarity to build a fairer economy for all workers and, in collaboration, replacing the fatally flawed NAFTA deal with the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Your continued leadership, including making solidarity, working in solidarity with workers in Mexico to ensure that their labor rights are protected, also means a more level and fair playing field for us in Canada and in the U.S because we know that when we fight together, we win together. Now to my friend Ken, I don't see him out here, I know he is here. Uh, to my friend Ken, so for almost two decades, the Canadian steelworkers have had the good fortune to be led by my friend Ken Newman. His dedication, his service to Canadian workers, Ken has made very important contributions to the Canadian labor movement and internationally. He has provided vital, progressive leadership when we have needed it the most and our, and our most, most difficult times. While I know that many of you in this room share memories of, of working with Ken or having crossed paths with Ken in many different ways, my story with Ken started when I was running for this position. Ken was in the room with a very small group of uh, national union leaders in Canada who I met with to find out whether or not I wanted to potentially run for this particular position that you see. And even though we hadn't known each other very long, Ken had my back from the very beginning and encouraged me and provided tireless support for my team and my campaign, and I'm forever grateful. Not only did he provide tireless support, I was so proud that the United Steelworkers Canada were the first to endorse my team and myself to run for the position of leadership of the Canadian Labour Congress. Thank you, my friends. <laughs> It really just makes me one of the so many who owe a deep debt of gratitude to Ken for his friendship and for his mentorship. And you know, I was completely intimidated the first time I met with the national president of the Steelworkers of Canada, and he is such a likable and immediately friendly individual who would phone you up just to say, how are things going? You're still in the running, right? You're not backing down, and you've got, we've got your back. And so I really, really valued and appreciated that. So Ken, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you you've done for workers, for all that you've done for the Canadian labour movement, and for the people of Canada. My friends, <laughs> the National Director of the Steelworkers plays a very important role in the Canadian labour movement and in Canadian political life. People like Lawrence McReardy, Leo Girard before him, and of course Ken have stood steadfast behind progressive values and a progressive agenda. And while they are very big shoes to fill, I know that my friend Marty Warren is absolutely going to be up for that job. He is bringing people together, and quite frankly, Marty gets things done. With both of us being relatively new to the national stage, I'm looking forward to working with Marty and collaborating further. Fortunately for Canada, Marty comes with a very impressive track record of political action. And that's because the steelworkers in Canada have such a strong and fierce record of political commitment, one I know that Marty is going to continue. Over 50 years ago, the Canadian Labour Congress worked with the, Canadian, with the Co Cooperative Commonwealth Federation to form a new party, where the trade union members, farmers, and progressives could come together in common cause. 
Since then, the steelworkers have been absolutely steadfast in their backing of not just the CLC, but of their commitment to the new Democratic Party in Canada. And I thank the steelworkers for their critical support, and I look forward to working with Marty and with his team to engage members and to engage union workers to become effective political advocates. Look, I'm under no illusion. We have a really steep hill to climb. We heard Sister Liz talk about the fact that we need to engage workers and to make sure that workers are paying attention to the issues. We don't have enough working class people involved in, in political action. We know this. And too many workers, including members of this union as well as my union, UFCW, are still voting against their best interest. We know this to be fact. And that is because we are not yet reaching them. We have to have those tough conversations. We have to have those discussions in the lunchrooms. And we know that the stakes are very high. Marty and I, along with everyone here, we have to expose the politics of grievance that is causing division and driving people to be at opposite ends of the spectrum in their communities, in their countries, and globally right now. But quite frankly, how do we do it? We have to show workers the importance of being involved firstly in their union and to work in common cause to make that positive change happen. Sorry, folks. <laughs> We must share the vital role that international trade unionism plays in achieving progress for working people right around the world. The history of the international labor movement is a testament of what we can accomplish when people come together, from the right to collective bargaining, to the 40-hour work week, and to having a weekend, to accomplishing workplace safety and health, and ensuring fair labor legislation. Recently in Canada, I'm absolutely embarrassed to say this, and most of you will have seen this on the news, we witnessed flagrant misuse of the language of our movement to serve the cause of hate and right-wing extremism in our capital in Ottawa. People who fought against striking workers in the past are now posing as people standing up for working people and for their families. And we know that these political opportunists have a really loud megaphone. But my friends, guess what? The fact is, we have a louder megaphone. Step by step, I believe that by working together, we can re-engage workers and turn this political engagement into a force for positive change. We know that there are daunting challenges before us. With right-wing anti-labor forces consolidated against us, it's never been more important for working people to come together. American and Canadian unions, we have battled this agenda before, and the steelworkers have always been at the forefront of that battle. And now more than ever, we have to fight for the hearts and the minds of everyday working people, encouraging activism and political engagement so that people stop voting against their own best interest. We have to help workers understand that we are strongest when we are united in a common cause. We have an opportunity in the months and the years ahead to exert our influence to make real, substantial, and positive change happen. And I know that under Marty's leadership, the steelworkers will continue to play an absolutely vital role in Canada's labor movement and also as an important affiliate of the CLC. It's now more important than ever for the voice of progressives to be heard loud and clear on Parliament Hill, on Capitol Hill, and in the corridors of power right around the world. The dark headlines that we are seeing internationally now must only strengthen our resolve. Those of us who are trying to build a better world, we have our work cut out for us. But I also very firmly believe that we are up to the job. The labor movement needs the strength, the activism, and the political commitment of the steelworkers to deliver on our ambitions. We need to stand together. We need to be connected by our common goals. And together, we can stand up for our rights, build a more equitable, inclusive, and fair society, and never, ever let those in power push us backwards by even one inch. So thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for your years of service. Congratulations to Marty and the Canadian team, and congratulations to the entire membership leadership team up here. Solidarity, my friends. All right, we, we, um, we have a couple of videos that we're going to go through now. And, and uh, look, this getting people into town um, has been difficult in some instances and travel and 
And so Senator Bob Casey has, um, was, was intending to be here, but the Senate's in session. He has to be there. We have so much going on in Washington. So he's graciously um, put together a short video for us. Look, Bob Casey is, is a friend of, of workers in Pennsylvania, and particularly this union. And we rely on the senator often to move legislation forward, to be part of the team in the Senate who is progressive, who's sort of always doing the right thing, who's on the right, always in the trade battles with us, is now has a, a bill moving forward so people can deduct their union dues from their taxes. It seems like a simple thing, but it was lost um, under, the, under the Trump tax program. And, and Bob's just a thoughtful and careful uh, leader in the Senate and in Pennsylvania and elected three terms as a Democrat here. So um, if, if we can, I'd like to roll the piece that Bob sent in for us. Hello, I'm Senator Bob Casey. I wanted to thank President Tom Conway and the Executive Board of the United Steelworkers for inviting me to speak to you today on this important occasion for the union and to appear by way of this video. And sorry I can't be with you in person. I am, as always, proud to stand with the steelworkers to fight on behalf of working people all across our Commonwealth and across our country. Tom, I can't say enough about how much I value your friendship, your guidance, uh, and of course your leadership of the men and women of the steelworkers. You took the helm of this union just nine months before the pandemic hit the whole country, but you were able to steer this ship through that period and I appreciate your leadership at this time. I particularly want to congratulate and welcome the new members of the executive board and those stepping into new roles on the board. I also want to say congratulations to Bernie Hall, the new director of uh, District 10 here in Pennsylvania. Bernie, I look forward to uh, working with you and, and uh, fighting alongside you. And obviously a huge thank you to, to Bobby McAuliffe for your leadership as district director, and I want to say to Bobby Mack how much we appreciate his work and wish um, you the, the, the best for a long and happy retirement. I want to extend as well a thank you and congratulations to Vice President uh, Redmond. The impact you've had not just on steelworkers, but the entire labor movement is immeasurable. So I look forward to continuing to work with you in your new role as Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. I want to say how much I appreciate as well the, the honor that you give me every day as a United States Senator to fight on behalf of working men and women in Pennsylvania. I wouldn't be in the Senate without the, the help of, of organized labor and especially the steel workers. And if you give me the chance every day to fight on your behalf and on behalf of working people on trade issues and health care issues and retirement security and so many other issues that are so important to you and to your families and to the union. The last few years, of course, have been particularly difficult um, for so many Americans, but I'm grateful for uh, the victories, the, the wins that we've been able to achieve together, ensuring early retirement by getting the Butch Lewis bill passed and signed into law, which is critical for so many members of the United Steelworkers of America getting the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed and signed into law by President Biden last November was a victory that was many decades in the making. It'll create a hell of a lot of jobs. By one estimate, 30,000 jobs each year in Pennsylvania for the next 10 years and 770,000 jobs across the nation. I know steelworkers played a huge role in helping secure passage of that bill uh, when you were uh, undertaking your campaign, the We Supply America campaign uh, that you ran last year to help help us pass the bill. We also we know that we have more work to do to lower costs for families. We need to get the cost of prescription drugs down for families, the cost of quality affordable child care, and so many other costs down for working families. Um, and we know that together we can do this. Uh, and we started on that path, of course, when we passed the rescue plan.
to provide more vaccinations, to open schools safely. So now, you know, before the rescue plan that was passed by only one side of the aisle, by the way, um, less than 50% of schools were open for in-person learning. Now it's almost 100%, somewhere between 95 and 98%. So that happened because of the rescue plan. We only had 2 million people vaccinated before the rescue plan. Now we got almost 215 million vaccinated. We help children and families and communities, and now we're helping them even more with the infrastructure bill. That's because you gave us the power to do these things. But we have a long way to go. We got a lot more to do. We got to pass the PRO Act. We've got to fight a lot more battles on behalf of working men and women. But I think if we're focused on lowering those costs for families, we can help in so many ways. We know that uh, we also have a great partner with Vice President Roxanne Brown and her team in Washington, D.C. to help us get there. So we have more to do. And I think you all know, and if you don't know, I'll tell you again, or, or tell you for the first time or repeat it for others, the story of what happened in Harrisburg about 30 years ago now, a little more than 30 years ago, when uh, the, the governor of Pennsylvania, who shared the same name as my own, <laughs> when Governor Casey decided he wanted to pay tribute to workers, he asked all the unions in Pennsylvania, and really the internationals were at the forefront of this, to fund, so there wouldn't be taxpayer money, it was funded um, a, a, a tribute to, to the American worker. And who did he pick? He, of course, had a bronze sculpture of a steel worker leaning into a big steel beam. That, um, that American worker, the portrait of the American worker by that bronze sculpture, a massive uh, sculpture, uh, was in front of the governor's residence for uh, for years until uh, until only a few years ago when it was moved to the Labor and Industry Department. But the reason he put that there was not just to remind the people of Pennsylvania, but to remind elected officials that working men and women built this country, working men and women built the middle class, and working men and women helped us win so many battles, including real battles and real wars like World War II. And now you're helping us to create a bright future for so many families. So just like that steel worker depicted in that bronze sculpture uh, led, indicated for us how important workers are and how important steel workers are, we want to remind uh, the country again how important your labor is, the dignity of your work, the skill and professionalism you bring to that work. So to use that old expression, early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and organize, some of us elected officials have to start doing that. So we appreciate your leadership, your example, and I want to congratulate all those who were being installed today, and I'm grateful to be with you again. God bless you and thank you. All right, again, I want to thank the Senator. He really is a good friend. He's a good friend to our union. He's always there when we need him. And, um, and having someone reliable in D.C. like that is, is crucial to the work that we do. All right, the next video that we're going to do is, is and this will be our last video, but it's, it's an important one. This is our friend and our leader, Leo. And so, you know, I stay in touch with Leo a lot, and we talk sometimes a couple of times a week. Um, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna see if Leo wanted to try and do this by Zoom, but getting Leo to do Zoom from a flip phone <laughs> was actually pretty challenging. So, so we've chosen to do this this way, and, um, and Leo was anxious to bring greetings and remarks and congratulations to the board. And so if, uh, if we could show that film now. Hi, I'm Leo Girard, the former president of the United Steelworkers, and I'm uh, honored to be able to address you for a few minutes today. I'm tremendously proud and want to acknowledge and recognize the great work that has been done by the International Union, both in U.S. and Canada, the great work that's been done by our leadership and our executive board, the great work that's been done by our staff, and in particular, the great work that's been done by our members. 
One of the reasons I say that is the last couple of years have been very, very contesting for everyone. The COVID with the uh, ransom on the computer system and all of those things. And I'm just tremendously proud that our union has kept up the fight, kept the union strong, managed to met, meet every challenge head on, and continue to make progress, whether it's in the legislative arena, the political arena, or in organizing. That work has uh, made our union one of the more respected unions in the international labor movement. With the work of Ken Newman and Tom Conway, we've managed to keep our international alliances strong. We've got alliances with Mexican workers, with Brazilian workers, with Australian, with New Zealand, with South Africa, with Germany, with UK, uh, and those international alliances that have been set, kept solid by the international union have uh, put us in a very good position when there's gonna be struggles. And we know that the future is gonna be very difficult with uh, the economy and the way we're going. And it's important that we recognize that we have a president of the United States who actually believes in unions. He actually believes that workers should have a chance to join a union. He believes that we need to strengthen the manufacturing base of the country, same as we do in Canada. And that by strengthening our manufacturing base, we, as the president Biden says, we can grow the labor movement. And our union has been well positioned to do that because of the work of the team of with Tom and uh, with Ken Newman in Canada. So I want to start by acknowledging that and recognizing it and just saying to you, as a former president, I'm tremendous, tremendously proud of the work that our team has done with Tom and Ken at the leadership, both in US and Canada. One of the comments that I would like to make is that I reflect back when I saw that President Biden had uh, got his infrastructure bill passed. And I reflected back to the days of Lynn Williams, George Becker, where we fought like hell to try and get an infrastructure program. We used to think we had a win when they do a highway bill for a couple of billion dollars that never really turned out to be much growth for the labor movement or the union. Now we've got a president that actually stands up and says this should be union work. Uh, and we know that in Canada, under Ken's leadership and the leadership of the new team in Canada, we have to recognize that labor relations in Canada and labor law in Canada is done at the provincial level. So in Canada, we have to fight for labor rights in all the provinces as well as the federal government. So I want to just simply say thank you. Uh, as I watch from a distance, I'm just so proud and look forward to the work that's gonna be done. I uh, want to acknowledge one thing that's maybe a little bit special for me. Uh, Fred Redmond and I go back a long ways to when Fred was president of his home local. Fred was a terrific uh, member of our International Executive Board as a vice president. And with the unfortunate passing of our friend and my friend, Rich Trumka, we had to make some decisions in the labor movement and Liz Schuler moved up to the presidency and someone needed to replace Liz. And the choice was made to choose Fred Redmond. I think that's a credit, not just to Fred, although it is to Fred, it's also to the labor movement and to our union. Our union in the sense that it is able to be recognized as one of the leading voices and the leading struggles for proper voting rights, for proper civil rights. And the fact that the international, or excuse me, not the international, that the FLCIO board unanimously chose Fred Redmond to replace Liz. That's a reflection of the good work that our union has done, but in particular, the good work that Fred has done over the years. And I can do that to most, I have almost every officer of the union. But I think in the case that uh, with Fred, that it's been special for me because we've been together for the as I say, he was president of his local union. Tom Conway is, uh, I talk to Tom every now and then, and I can only say that to you that he's doing a terrific job under adverse circumstances. And the fact that we're going to uh, move with a new team, we've got to keep our union strong and I'm convinced that that's going to happen. We've got to be active in the legislative arena in both countries. We've got to be active in the political arena in both countries. We need to be an organizing union and discussions with Fred, or not with Fred, excuse me, discussions with Ken Newman a few days ago, we were reflecting on the fact that 
In Canada, we've had a multitude of mergers, everything from the University of Toronto to the communication workers in, in uh, Canada. We've never lost a merger vote in Canada when there was a choice between our union and another one where an independent organization was looking for a home. We've won every vote. That's a reflection on the fact that our union is acknowledged for its strength, for its diversity, and for its tenaciousness of never giving up. And when we have a struggle, we make sure that we put the best tools in place so that we can succeed. Under Tom's leadership, we've been able to keep our union strong. We've been able to organize. We've been able to have legislative agenda. And we know that the Democratic Party counts on the United Steelworkers. The Democratic Party is going to have to work hard this spring and this summer as we fight for the Voting Rights Act, and as we look at what's going to happen in the midterms, I'm convinced that we need to win the midterms. Otherwise, we don't know what that other former president would do if he was to ever get power again. And our work and our de determination to succeed has never wavered. As Lynn used to say, one day longer, one day stronger. Again, let me close by saying I want to thank you for the great work you've done. I want to tell you that we look very forward to the, to the future, that the union is strong and that the work that you will do will be there for future, genera for future generations. We've organized in every sector of the economy, but in particular, it's been a very fascinating experience because we're one of the fastest growing unions in both the United States and Canada on higher education. And in that case, we've been a loud leading voice on there. We've been a leading voice on health and safety. We've been a leading voice on diversity. We've been a leading voice on civil rights. We're a leading voice on organizing. And so that doesn't happen without a commitment from the leadership, a commitment from the staff, and in particular, a commitment and a tenacity to the membership who join in the struggle and join in the advocacy. Let me close by saying what our logo says, unity and strength for workers. That's our motto, that's our, our acknowledgement, and that's our struggle. Thank you very much. Solidarity forever. Apuyo's been a great friend, personal mentor. It's good to see him engaged. He's, he's always concerned, always aware, um, and it's good for him to spend some time um, talking with us about where he sees things going. So, look, we're going to go into that section of the program where we're going to do the installation of the officers and then the directors. And so um, I've taken sort of a personal point of privilege and I've asked my granddaughter, Gabrielle, to come and swear me in. So, Gabe, if you'll come forward, help me. I, Thomas Conway. I, Thomas Conway. Do you hereby sincerely pledge my honor to perform the duties of my office as prescribed by the laws of the organization? <laughs> you got that Do you one? hereby sincerely pledge my honor to perform the duties of my office as prescribed by the laws of the organization? And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. Do you want me to cut off this next one? No. I will deliver to my successor in office all books and other property of this union that may be in my possession at the close of my official term. I will deliver to my successor in office all books and other property of this union that may be in my possession at the close of my official term. All of this I solemnly promise. All of this I solemnly promise. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle and destitute of honor. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle and destitute of honor. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> All 
right, if I could ask the officers and vice presidents to remain standing, um, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, John Shell. Do hereby sincerely pledge my honor to perform the duties of my office. Do hereby pledge my honor to perform the duties of the office. As prescribed by the laws of the organization. Subscribe by the laws of the organization. And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. I will deliver to my successor in office all books and other property of this union. I will, I will deliver to my successor in office all books and other property of this union. That may be in my possession at the close of my official term. That may be in my possession at the close of my official term. All of this I solemnly promise. All this I solemnly promise. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge. Is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle and destitute of honor. Is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle and destitute of honor. Congratulations. <laughs> Now we got to do the next crew. All right, so if you directors remain standing, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I do hereby sincerely pledge my honor to perform the duties of my office. As prescribed by the laws of the organization. As prescribed by the laws of the organization. And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. And to bear true allegiance to the United Steelworkers. I will deliver to my successor in office. I will deliver to my successor in office. All other books and property of this union. All other books and property of this union. That may be in my possession at the close of my official term. That may be in my possession at the close of my official term. All of this I solemnly promise. All of this I solemnly promise. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge. With full knowledge that to violate this pledge. Is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle. Is to stamp me as a person devoid of principle. And destitute of honor. And destitute of honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have another quick, short, really short video we're going to run, and then, um, <laughs> then I have a keynote speech that you've got to sit through, so let's get to Working hard is nothing new to us. It's always been who we are. 
in our greatest time of need and some of these darkest days we're going through, you're shining brighter than ever. You're keeping our nations going. You're doing the work that really matters. And you're making the things we're going to need to get through this the most. You've always been and will always be the most important part of all of us. Essential. I know things are tough right now, but together we're tougher. We'll get through this like we've gotten through other things before by sticking together. So as you roll up your sleeves and you do the work that can't be done from home and that are on the front lines of what's going on, know how grateful people are for you and the work you're doing. And you should be proud of yourselves and we're so very proud of you. And know that your union is fighting every second of every day to make sure that you're treated right, that you're safe, and that the conditions you're in are as best as they can be. So brothers and sisters, for the heart you're displaying and for your courage and for your commitment to each other and for your service, we thank you and we urge you to stay safe and take care of each other. to talk to you a little bit. Um, it's a period of time for us to reflect about where we've been and what we've done over the last couple of years and where we're at now and what we're doing and then where we're going and what we're going to do in the future. Um, first, I want to thank and congratulate these officers and this board and this team of tireless trade union workers and everyone who's up here gets up every day to improve the lives of working people and puts, puts that forward and makes that their priority, not only in both our two countries, but in around the world. And I'm really very proud to be part of this team, and I just want to acknowledge that going forward, I, I have nothing but good feelings about this executive board and where we're going to go forward. And, and I'd like to also mention this is one of the few times when we can gather together with friends and families and I understand that families make sacrifices to have your loved ones do the kind of work that they do for the union, the time it takes away from home, and then the difficulty challenges that they acknowledge. So I appreciate your allowing that to go on because we need that work that they're able to do in order for us to move forward. I want to thank Rabbi Meyer, who really led the Pittsburgh community through a tremendous, terrible time and for joining us today. Our, our friend, President Schuler, Liz is, is a tremendous asset to the labor movement and a friend to us. B, for joining us today. We, we, we welcome your partnership with you um, and to continue to strengthen our international relationship between our Canadian and and American brothers and sisters. Um, I want to particularly thank Senator Casey and then my friend Leo for taking the time out of their schedules to be part of the steel worker. We're joined today um, by Rick Bloomingdale and Frank Snyder of the Pennsylvania State AFL-CIO, um, good friends of ours, good helpers in Pennsylvania. I'm looking forward to Rick has announced his retirement. Um, I'm looking forward to nominate steelworker Frank Snyder to that position in the end of March. And, and Frank's, Frank's one of ours and, and will lead us forward in Pennsylvania. But I also want to take a moment and acknowledge, and we've talked a bit about here today, um, my colleague Fred Redman. And Fred has announced at the end of March his retirement. And at that point, the board will take up his replacement and we'll deal with it. Um, but for now, you know, look, we're not losing Fred. Liz is gaining Fred. And Fred's going to be a phone call away and continue to do great work on behalf of the labor movement. And we're just very proud of Fred. And we're very proud of the work that he's done. And Fred and I started out together as staff reps in the old District 31. 
worked together on a lot of contracts, um, moved up through the union um, in, in some ways on some parallel uh, paths. And then at about the same time, roughly, Fred and I both became vice presidents of the steel workers. And, um, and it was pretty exciting. And there was a guy who used to work here, many of you will know, John Perkwin. John was like an FBI agent, and he, <laughs> he somehow found out that neither Fred nor I had a valid driver's license. <laughs> and that came about, it was kind of a technicality, you know, having to do with speeding tickets and unpaid speeding tickets. And, and in Ohio, they would have a cop every six miles posted. So Fred and I would be driving back and forth, and, and these tickets would pile up, and John got excited about it. And so um, John turned us into Leo. And he went in and said, you know those two jerks you just hired as vice presidents don't have driver's licenses. And John told us we had to park the cars, and we skirted around that. But there was, in Gary, Indiana, there was a driver's, a, a, a DMV that you could go to, and if you had enough money, they would get you legal in a day. And so Fred and I, now we were vice president, like, eh, you can't get away with nothing anymore around here. So off we go, we go to Gary, uh, we get ourselves legal, and, and I presume Liz, you should check, but I think it's, the papers are probably in order now. So. Uh, look, I'd like to also take a moment to mention um, Gabe and the fact that I've had her come in from California to swear me in. And I've done that not only because she's my granddaughter and I love her, but I've done it because of the symbolism of having a young female activist who can, who can be part of a union like this going forward. And, and I want that image out there that, that this union welcomes young people and welcomes people as a place where they can move forward and form and join unions and, and make a real difference in their lives because our country is at a turning point. And, and look, Gabe, not only by virtue of being part of this family, makes sense. I, I can remember when she was in sixth grade, she started a campaign because her school didn't have um, a wastebasket for, for recyclables. And so posters went up, and she organized other sixth graders, and, it's, and the principal would say to her dad, what's this kid doing? Um, but she got him there, you know? And then later on, I saw her after the Parkland organizing her community about gun safety in schools in particular. Um, we saw her do a lot of social justice work. During Black Lives Matter, <laughs> she told us she was going down to Grand Park and they were going to confront the cops. And I remember me and one of her uncles saying, Gabe, this is the Chicago cops. They know how to do this stuff, so you better be careful. But she got down there and got jostled around and saw it as a badge of honor. And so I think that is how I want young people to think about this union, that there is a place for us, that there is a way for us to make a better living in times when it's so hard to be able to make a living ourselves. And, and we're in, a, in an economy and for particularly difficult for young people. Look, two and a half years ago, we left this ceremony, the same ceremony. We started on the path to do some restructuring, restructure how our executive board functioned, to have more dialogue, to be more open, to talk through our problems, to share ideas and approaches with each other and to look at the way that our legislative and political efforts were closer aligned, and to go into our districts and our communities and hold town halls and begin to educate ourselves and our members by explaining what our true core values as trade unionists were, and to learn what they needed from their union. And we told them 
This is your voice, your union, and your voice. And that was our campaign, and that remains our campaign today. And along the way, we moved people into different positions, and we've worked at giving them broader responsibility. We've looked at how we've, our sector leadership works when we bargain. We made departmental changes through promotions and worked at communicating differently, both more directly within the organization and outside. We launched an organizing initiative in the tire sector in the South to bring under contracts a series of plans that had sprung up there, largely because of the trade work that we've done and the enforcement work. And those workforces were treated terribly, and we developed a plan to protect and preserve our traditional sectors, and we staffed our paper sector both to better service contracts and to a strategy to organize the immense number of organized, unorganized box shops. And we're not walking away from that, and we're never walking away from that. We're not going to give up those sectors, we're not going to sit back, and we're not going to see them continue to roll up unorganized. We are going to fight and make the investments and build the teams and go in there and continue to organize those sectors. Okay. We were in the middle of all this. We were starting this when COVID hit. And it hit both our nations and everyone went into hibernation. And it was really difficult. All those face-to-face -face initiatives we were working on were, were scrambled. And there was a cloud of uncertainty over everything and everywhere we looked. And we had suffered significant losses and membership losses in those first months. And we were forced to suspend our local union meetings in person. We weren't sure how safe our workplaces were. We had recalcitrant employers who didn't want to make the sort of changes they had. Um, we had members who were confused by the confusion coming out of Washington. The early days of COVID were difficult for us. Um, and our nations hunkered down. But so many of our members didn't have that option. They had to go to work. They couldn't stay home. They had to show up. They were deemed essential, later on expendable. But we couldn't just sit back and let them go in there alone. So our, our union really strung and swung into action. And the entire union really went into gear and began to answer those questions that we needed to. We began a massive education and outreach program on how to deal with workplace COVID issues. We went out to find and secure the right PPE. We confronted these employers about the conditions in the shop. We continually updated, published, disseminated guidelines to our locals on what felt like a constantly changing nature of the virus. And our priority was in helping our members stay informed and safe at work and every one of them get through this safety. Our healthcare, our healthcare communications, our safety team, our communications experts, they made it happen on a daily basis. And then we all learned to Zoom. And it was actually sort of amazing. We bargained our contracts virtually. We held important meetings at all levels of our organization. We handled bankruptcies. We arbitrated grievances. We serviced our locals. We engaged in national elections and ran campaigns in both countries. We organized and ran a campaign about our infrastructure needs and helped lead the way in passing that historic legislation. We organized new workplaces virtually and ran and won elections. We adjusted the practices in our building and workplaces and we trained our staff and we grew more accustomed to this technology. And we learned how to reach further into our union than we had possibly ever done before. Our departments began scheduling virtual meetings across the union on every topic. We established our labor education efforts, our strategic campaigns began to operate virtually, and our contract fights organized that way as well. And our communication and media organizations and operations helped us hone and tighten those skills. And just last week, we held a rapid response conference with 350 people attending because after 
January 6th, it's hard to go to Capitol Hill and lobby in person, but we've lobbied effectively last week virtually using these tools. So, look, COVID never shut this union down. We adjusted, we taught ourselves new tricks, and we did our jobs. And our union, despite early pandemic membership losses that seemed like they would be devastating, we quickly regained our footing. We functioned highly and efficiently throughout the empire period. And, and look, everybody in this union should take pride in that and getting that work done. So we're at a turning point. What are we doing now? And what are we gonna do? Most of the restrictive practices are getting lifted. It feels like we're turning a corner. It feels like we could get back together. We've held major events such as this. We've held some district conferences. Um, we think we, we've set this up as safely as we can today with smaller tables and wider settings and masking where necessary. And, um, and we've got to get back out there with our members. And, that, and that's what we intend to do. We've reinstituted our membership meeting um, requirements in April. Um, we gathered together here as a board for the first time in two years. We're touring our plants, we're negotiating contracts face to face, and we're on picket lines together where it's necessary. In April, we're once again going to start an effort of reinstituting our town hall meetings with our local union membership and our leaders directly. And we'll learn from each other and we'll build out on what we've begun. Tomorrow in our headquarters, we're going to train together to prepare for that initiative and, to, and prepare our people to take our important Your Union, vo Your Voice message out there and again, go to the streets, go to the town halls, re-engage our membership, talk with our membership. It's not just going to be a periodic slogan and we're not just going to show up at election time. This is the way this union has to and is going to operate in the future. We are going to engage directly with our members, talk to them, explain to them what are core labor issues and why they need to be on our side, why this division that exists so deeply that Liz and B talked about, we can break through it. We've got to go out there and do that. And we've got to do the work and break through it. And that's where we're going as a union in the future. We, we, put out, we put out advertisements last week. We're looking to hire organizers. And we're looking across the union, within our shops. Those are the kind of people who can talk to other workers. And if we can get people and develop those skills and find people with those skills of persuasion to be able to relate to what's going on and, and know how to stand up to a boss who's trying to break an organizing drive. Because they'll use every trick in the book and break every law that they need. But we can staff this the right way. And so, look, not everybody's going to be able to do this work. This is some of the hardest work that the union does. But we want to we get people in here. And so we want to search our shops talk to some who we might not otherwise. We have a great core of activists who often come out and help us on political and other events and organizing events. But there is, in order to talk to our union, we've got to talk at a deeper level. And that's what this will do. And this will give us a chance for people to directly make an application to the union and to get consideration. And we'll bring them out and we'll give them a shot. We'll give them a try. And we'll see how it works. And we'll try and build off of this. We have a lot of organizing work to do. Look, this, this, this country's at a really a turning point. You know, we, we've heard so much about um, Striketober and the great resignation and that people aren't working or can't, um, employers can't find work. And look, that stuff is true. People are kind of tired of, of bullshit from employers and they're pushing back and there's an opportunity here there's an opportunity for us as a labor movement to step into that void and to explain how they actually can do things better with their lives and young people you know you hear a lot saying well they don't want to work well they don't want to work 80 hours a week 
You know, they want to they want to work 40 hours a week. What, what's wrong with that? I mean, why is that suddenly a bad idea? I mean, I, look, many of us grew up in shops where you could get in a knife fight over who was going to get the next overtime turn. But people aren't standing in line for that. And they don't want to work that way. And we shouldn't have to work that way or promote that. So there is, there is a, a feeling in our nations. And there is a feeling in this country. And people kind of know how to organize. These young people are organizing through their social media. And they're not just sending, sending Instagrams to each other. They are showing up at events when it's time to show up. And we need to be part of that. We need to lead that and lead them forward. So this union is going to put its efforts and its, its money and its mouth behind organizing. And we're going to grow over the next couple of years. And we've grown well. In our organizing department over the last few years, we've made a lot of progress. We've organized over 20,000 people in different sectors, in colleges, in healthcare, in high tech. We're making electric buses. But there's a growth opportunity out there as well. And there's a new energy market that's coming on. And while we need to be careful about what it means to our traditional sectors like oil and auto manufacturing, we can't be ignorant of the fact that those changes are coming. And there's going to be mining needs. We, we have a mining conference scheduled in April where we're going to talk about how we approach lithium mining, nickel mining, cobalt mining, the materials, the coppers that are going to be needed. The country maybe fully yet doesn't understand what's ahead of them. But between both our countries, North America, these materials are here in a, in a responsible, sustainable way that can be mined and extracted without harming communities and done safely for workers. And our union plays a role in that economy going forward. We're not just going to sit back and watch it roll over us and put us out of business as if we were making buggy whips. So look, our challenge is going forward is about being able to grow that way. We're going we're gonna to fight at the bargaining table. Look, for years we put up with bosses when there was a, a, a heavy labor market and people were looking for work. You'd show up for bargaining and boss would turn out his pockets and say, ah, you know, you're all lucky you got a job. But there's a thousand people out there standing in line waiting for your job. Well, it ain't that way no more. Now it's our turn. And so when we're going to the bargaining table, we're going to be aggressive at the bargaining table. And we may not be able to roll back every problem we ever had, but we're going to fight. We're not taking soft contracts. We're going to get decent wages. We're not going to get health care rolled up on us in the way it's been in the past. And our bargainers have a sense and know that this is our time, and we're going to look to bargain good contracts going forward. So I had a speech written, now it's all over the place. I don't know where it is. I lost it. Look, I would, today, tonight our president is going to deliver his first State of the Union address. This, frankly, is an amazing guy. And never in our history, in our lifetimes, have we heard a president talk about unions the way Joe Biden talks about unions. And, is, and it's not out of a sense of nostalgia or even that he thinks he owes the union something for his elections. Biden sees the growth of, of collective bargaining in unions as a way to rebuild a middle class that is genuine, that has its own source of independent power, that people can come together and bargain with their employers and do better for themselves. And so it's part of his economic plan. It's not just his rhetoric, and it's not just how he sees things. But to have a president who will stand up and say regularly, you should be in a union. You should be part of a union. To have that in this nation after 30 years of onslaught of them beating on us, we have an opportunity, and we have to take it. We can't fail to take it. So over the coming years, that's why we're going to organize. I also have to say, too, that, that 
in all the challenges that this president's facing, um, some of the gravest are ahead of him right now with what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine. And this union is going to stand behind this president and stand behind the Ukrainian workers and stand behind the people in Ukraine who are doing nothing more but fighting for the same freedoms that we have. So those voices that are out there who are going to try and play political games with this, who would try and minimize what's going on in the Ukraine and, and to those people and to those workforces, we're going to stand against them too. This country has to do something about that. We can't sit idly back. This president, I believe, has the will to do that, and we're going to stand for him. So, look, this union... <laughs> this union going forward, our, our, our plan is simple. We're going to continue to fight for better conditions for working people, better contracts, better wages, more time with their families, a better deal than we've had before and over the past three decades. And when we meet obstacles, we're going to do what we've done over the last two years. We're going to find a workaround. We're going to get around them. We're going to keep moving. We're going to keep fighting. And we're going to organize like this union has never organized before in our lifetime. So when you want to sort of think about what are we going to do going forward, we're going to be steel workers. That's what we're going to do. So I want to thank you for your time. All right, look, um, so it's about time to get, some, get a free meal out of this. So there, there's food and open bars are going to be set up outside in the King's Garden area. Um, and then in order to sort of keep this thing as safe as you can, there's going to be a bunch of buffet lines. Get yourself some food, get a drink. Um, either eat out there, find a table out there, or bring your food back in here. Um, we're, we're happy to have you join us um, and spend the rest of the afternoon. And look, we'll get through here before the end of the day. I got to return this suit to the rental company soon. So, um, look, I just want to thank each of you for being part of this, for the work that you do for the union every day, um, for helping the board. Uh, celebrate this and for the work that we know that we can count on you going forward and, and we rely on you and the work that you do so tremendously. So thanks very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you.